For those of you guys watching online from coast to coast and across the fruited plains, we'd like to welcome you to Lynchburg City Church. My name is Joe, and I'm the pastor here. And if God puts it on your heart to give to the church, well, you can do so by going to lynchburgcitychurch.com. I just want to pray for us right now. Uh, Jesus, we love you so much. Um, Lord, for, um, for our friends, James and, and Angela, who aren't here with us right now, Lord, uh, my heart's really heavy. Um, and, and, and Lord, for, for his dad, who is in the hospital, and, and the doctors are telling him that they don't think he's going to live, Lord. Um, man, that's a lot. That's a lot, Lord. And, and so I pray, God, um, that you would work a miracle, because that's, that's the only way I guess his dad's going to live. And I pray that you would work a miracle, and that you might receive all glory and honor for doing that, so, Lord, please help him. Please, Lord, I pray, Lord, for his dad, for healing. Oh, Jesus, help him. Help him. And, and Lord, I, I pray that, you know, I'm thinking like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Like, our God can, can save us. And, and even if he doesn't, Lord, even if you don't, I, I pray, Lord, that we will still trust you. And we, our faith will only be stronger for it, Lord. For we know that your ways are not, are not our ways, right? Lord, your, your thoughts are above our thoughts. But we do pray for a miracle. We pray that you would, you would spare James' dad's life. Lord, we think of, of our president, our vice president, our speaker of the house. And Lord, we pray for special mercy on them right now, Lord. Special mercy, special grace, special wisdom for... For, for the president's health, Lord. I, I pray for his health, Lord. I pray for uh, his mind, and I pray for his decision-making. I pray, Lord, that you just give him grace. Just grace, Lord. Help him, Jesus. Lord, for uh, our soldiers, our sailors, airmen, marines, coast guardsmen, Lord, for the, the border agents, I pray, Lord, for their protection. I pray for their safety. Uh, those who are at home and abroad, I, I pray for their salvation. Lord, for our enemies, I pray that you would confuse and frustrate their plans and that you might be merciful to them too and save them. And Lord, we think of the persecuted church. I'm thinking of Leah Sherabu being held by Boko Haram in Nigeria. I'm thinking of Pastor Yusuf imprisoned in Iran. I'm thinking of Pastor Wang and John in China. I'm thinking of our brothers just dealing with persecution in Western Canada and Alberta. Lord, for the Christians in North Korea and, and Eritrea, in Nigeria, Jesus, help them. And, and we remember those who are in chains as if in chains with them. We pray that you would strengthen their faith, God, that you would provide for whatever their needs may be. And, and Lord, today, my prayer is that we'd hear from you. We want to hear from you, Lord. So I pray you'd free us from distraction. I pray that, Lord, you'd convict us where we need to be convicted. I pray you'd encourage us where we need encouragement. And that we'd hear from you, Lord. I pray you'd help me to say exactly what you want me to say. If there's something you don't want me to say, well, then don't let me say it, God. And if there's something, Lord, that I need to say that maybe I haven't even planned on saying, well, then give me a word. I pray for uh, a fresh anointing, Lord. And, Lord, that you would give us ears to hear today. Jesus, we love you, and we need you, always. In your name we pray, amen. Part two, Genesis. Genesis chapter 127, we're picking up from where we left off last week. This is part two. Mm, it's going to be some journey, guys. Some journey. I think I was talking to Amelia, and she's like, I think, there's a, is there a possibility I might be married and have like multiple kids by the time we finish this? And I assured her, I assured her it won't be quite that long of a series. Um, but, uh, but, but, uh, it, it, it's, you know, it's, it'll be good. I think it'll be good. And today, you picked a good day to come, I think. Uh, this was, man, this was encouraging to my heart this last week, so let's get into it. Genesis chapter 1, 27, starting part 2 of our series. So God created man in his own image. 
In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion. Now remember that word dominion is very much linked with what it means to be made in the image of God. We talked about that last week. Over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed and its fruit. You shall have them for food, and to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life. I have given every green plant for food. And it was so, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was, no, it's not just good. It's very good. And there was evening, and there was morning the sixth day. The idea of the Imago Dei, the idea of the image of God, this is now introduced a second time. We talked a lot about this last week. So much to talk about, which is why we're going to talk about more about the image of God this week. And there's a lot of talk today about uh, equality. That's a really hot word. Really, really buzzword. When you hear the word equality, you might think good, you might think bad, you might be indifferent. But This is a lot about equality. While the word's not mentioned directly, um, the fact that God made them men and women and he made them both in the image of God, it's it's pretty clear, like, this issue comes up. And today, when we think about equality, what usually gets brought up, and it could be equality of economics, right? We want equal outcomes. And some will say, well, no, we want equal opportunities. But the equality within the context obviously has to do with people. And, and you should understand that I am operating from a very much a biblical uh, world view. No shocker there. Uh, at least I hope it's not. Probably would be a shocker, I guess, in some churches today. I guess it just depends on which one you're going to. But, but equality. Um, equality among the sexes. So I'm going to operate that there's two sexes, there's two genders, male, female, XX, XY, that's it. Not because I'm mean or something, just because that's what the Bible says, okay? And I, don't, I, don't want, I don't want to be a jerk, because sometimes, sometimes we'll be like, there, take it, right? But that's what, that's what God says. I'm not trying to play fast and loose with the text. I try to be a very strict textualist. That's just what it says. And it's always interesting. I listen to Al Mohler. He always, he points out the, uh, the challenges that the LGBTQ community have, because there's that pesky little, he calls it pesky little T, right? Because you have gay, you have lesbian, you have bisexual. Think about bisexual, right? I desire someone who is what? Male or... Whoa, hold on, hold on. That, that's a problem. What do you mean it's only one or the other? And you can see even that, that's, that's what happens today, right, with equality. It's, it's no matter how liberal you are, you're never liberal enough. If you're liberal today, tomorrow you're conservative. And, and inevitably, they end up eating their own. Of course, in the name of equality. And we see this, especially even with, in female sports. We see the strong feminist movement ultimately just being devoured, okay? Where now you have men participating in female sports. But we call it equality. We call it equality. So how should we, how should we think about equality? Well, we should think about verse 27. In fact, I've heard Piper say this many times. The greatest statement of equality in the entire Bible is found in verse 27. So let's look at it. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. He didn't have to do that. He could just sit and male. Didn't have to do female, but he does. The greatest statement of equality. You want an argument for equality? It's Genesis chapter 1, 27. Right there. People say, oh, Christians, you guys don't believe in equality. Yes, we do. Maybe not the equality that you want, but we, we very much believe in equality. God made them man and woman, and he made them both in the image of God. And uh, that is the greatest statement. But we also know that God, while the genders are equal, because we have this statement of equality, he also made us different. He is different, and... and we believe here at Lynchburg City Church in uh, a biblical view of what's known as complementarianism. That while we're equal, the sexes, we're made to complement each other. Okay? We're made to complement. So God has certain roles for our genders. And I'm thankful. I'm thankful that one of my roles is not to have a baby. <laughs> I just prefer not, I just, I, I don't like pain, guys. 
So I am thankful. I am thankful that there are different roles, but we complement each other. Like tag teaming this up. And it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see that, that, that we're made equal but different. I mean, just look at little kids for a second. You get a bunch of little, little girls together, what are they going to do? They're probably going to go in their room and have a tea party. Okay, that's what little girls do. We get a bunch of little boys, you know what they're going to do? They're going to go raid that room and shoot the little girls. That's what little boys do. They're going to go shoot the girls. So, so we're made equal, but we're also made different. And different's not bad. See, see, today in our culture, what our culture does is our culture encourages women to act more like men, and it encourages men to be more like women, and then it labels that quality. And oh, by the way, if you don't comply, then it's called toxic. So, so at, the, at the end of the day, we, we have to submit ourselves to some authority. And the challenge that the church deals with is the culture is constantly trying to seep into the cracks of the church. It is. So, so we really have to make sure, am I thinking biblically on this? Because the culture will say, well, if, if you don't agree with us, well, you're a racist or you're not compassionate. Well, I don't, I don't think that's true. But what happens is, even among Christians, we feel that pressure, right? That peer pressure. And then we end up submitting ourselves not to the authority of the Bible, but we end up submitting ourselves to some other authority. At the end of the day, guys, you're either submitting yourselves to the authority of the Bible, even if it's not popular with what... The culture says, or you're submitting yourselves to the culture or some other made-up version of what is right and what is wrong. Oh, the greatest statement of equality is right here in Genesis chapter 1, 27. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, both of them. Didn't have to do it like that, he did. Both men and women are made in the image of God. They're both equal, but they're different. They have different roles. They complement one another. Well, we continue. Chapter 2 now, verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God finished his work, notice that word work, that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, there it is again, that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because On it, God rested from all his work, there it is again, that he had done in creation. Work, this idea of human labor, um, is given this highest nobility. It's viewed as a good thing. Work is a good thing. Now, we might not always like work, but work is a good thing. God made work. And and this can, once again, be confusing because the culture will say, "Eh, work's not good. Why should you have to work? Universal basic income. You get paid. You get paid. You get paid. I don't care if you work. And so the culture very much has created this idea that work is bad. We should resist it. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible doesn't say that. God did this work. And it is pictured here as a good thing. Guys, we were made to work. We were made to work. I understand. Sometimes it's not fun, okay? And this is part of the result of the curse. We haven't got there yet. It's not always fun, but we were made to work. It's not a bad thing uh, by by any means whatsoever. And we go on, and it says this. It says, notice what he says here. What are we talking now? Rested. Because on it, God rested. So verse 3, God blessed the seventh day. He made it holy. On that day, the seventh day, God rested, and he rested from all his work that he had done in creation. Now, um, I have the Hebrew word right here for rested. Right there. So, so the word rested means to cease, to desist, or to rest. And the reason I want to put that up there for a second is because when we see rested, well, it kind of can be kind of confusing. And, and that's why I wanted you to see some of the other meanings of rested, which means cease and desist. I think it's probably those first two that, that best convey the idea. In other words... It doesn't mean that, oh man, God rested. He, he was really tuckered out from all that work. Like, oh man, you know, I could go eight day, but now nah, we're just going to call it seven. No, like that, that would suggest some type of deficiency. Okay? He's not deficient. Not at all. So, so rested is, is best understood as really, uh, here's what I'd say, the cessation of creative activity. The cessation of creative activity. 
It has the same sense, of course, when you get to Genesis chapter 8, 22, when it, in the post-Diluvian era, when it talks about the, the times and the seasons, they're never going to cease, right? So God is ceasing from creative activity. And he does it on the seventh day. And God blessed the seventh day, and God made it holy. He blessed it, and he made it holy. And, and here what we have is we have this introduction to the theology of the Sabbath that is mentioned right here, which is a reminder about work. And, and when, I, when we talk about the Sabbath, the Sabbath is not this idea of aversion to work, but rather it's celebrative in nature. It's celebrative that the cessation of the completed work, right? We, we look back, we're like, wow, look at all that work I did. Wow, that's what's happening. It's not, it's the Sabbath, and we hate work, but look at this. Look what God did. The text told us back in verse 31, and it was very good. Work is good. And so this theology of work is introduced here. God blessed the seventh day. And, and the question comes up then when, it, when we talk about the Sabbath is, well, do we still observe the Sabbath or don't we? How, how should we think about this? And we, we address this, I don't know, a few months ago back in Acts, I think. Maybe not quite that long. But I think it's worth mentioning again, since we're in Genesis now. How should we think about the Sabbath? Is this something we need to observe? Are we wrong for not observing it? And, and these are some considerations I'd, I'd point out. And the first thing I'd point out is this. And if you're taking notes, I'll, I'm just going to kind of give you bullet points. Boom, boom, boom. Number one. Although a day of rest and worship is very much demonstrated here in uh, creation, in Genesis chapter 2, the, the Saturday Sabbath, it was given to Israel as a sign of the Mosaic Covenant. Exodus 31, 16 to 17 affirms that. So keep that in mind. Number two, there is no command in the New Testament, in the New Testament for Christians who observe the Sabbath. No command. I, I look, not a command. Number three, even in the Mosaic era, Okay? In the Old Testament, it neither commanded the Gentile nations to observe the Sabbath, nor condemned them for failing to actually do so, which would seem to indicate that it was mainly for Israel. Number four, Jerusalem Council, Acts 15. It's been a while since we were in Acts 15, but in short, Acts 15, the council got together. They're like, we got this new thing called the church. How is this going to work? We've got Jews and we've got Gentiles. And, and how are they supposed to hang out? How are they supposed to have meals together? How are they supposed to have fellowship? The Jews have all these different like rules and regulations. So they're like, all right, maybe if, here's what we'll do. If the, if the Gentile Christians are at least able to do X, Y, and Z, I think we can make this work. I think that will allow for the Jewish Christians who maybe have stronger convictions to still be able to hang out, to s sit down, to have a meal together. But you know what's interesting in the Jerusalem Council? Out of all the things that they mentioned, you know what they didn't mention? Anything about the Gentiles need to observe the Sabbath? Oh, that was interesting. Here's a fifth point of consideration. The Apostle Paul warned the Gentiles about a ton of different sins in his epistles. A ton of different sins. You want to know one sin he never actually warned them about? Sabbath breaking. Not one time. Number six, for consideration, Colossians chapter 2, 16 to 17. Colossians 2, 16 to 17. It actually describes the Sabbath as a shadow. A shadow of Christ. And, and the shadow is, is no longer binding on us since the substance, that's Christ. Christ is the substance of the shadow since he's come. Seventh point for consideration, Galatians chapter 4, verse 10 and 11. Paul's going to rebuke the Galatians for thinking that God expected them to observe all these special days including Sabbaths. Number eight, Romans chapter 14, verse five, it actually declares observing the Sabbath to be a matter of personal preference among the converted Jews. A lot of these Jews became Christians. They had, like, they had these, these consciences, these, these stronger consciences. They felt really convicted because this is culture, right, to us. Like, this is what we grew up. We grew up in observing the Sabbath, and like, I kind of feel like we still need to do that. And Paul was like, if that's the case, if it's a matter of conscience, personal preference, you go ahead and do that. Number nine, in the book of Acts and all the subsequent writings of the early church fathers, it makes it clear the church gathered on Sundays. Sundays, not Saturdays. The, the, early in the second century, the early church father Ignatius, this is what he wrote. Let every friend of Christ keep the Lord's Day as a festival, the resurrection day, the queen and the chief of all the days, the Lord's Day, the first day of the week, Sunday. In fact, Tertullian, one of the other church fathers who lived in the second 
uh, in third centuries, he referred to Christians as, get this, those to whom Sabbaths are strange. Sabbaths are strange to Christians in the second and third centuries. And this shouldn't come as, I think, a huge surprise, because what does Jesus say when you get to Mark chapter 2, verse 27? Jesus says, the Sabbath was made for man. Do you know that? Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even over the Sabbath. Jesus reminds his hearers in Mark chapter 2 that God designed the Sabbath to be a gift, a merciful day for spiritual reflection, for physical recuperation. It's not supposed to be a burden. And that's what the Pharisees had turned it into. And yet, I think the principle for the Sabbath is still good and important and meaningful. It's good to take rest. It is. It's good to take a break. It's good to enjoy the fruit of your labor because in doing so, it's a picture of creation. It's a picture of what God did. And some of us, we, I think we, we, we struggle with this. The workaholics among us, okay? It can be a struggle. Um, we think, I can't take a day off. No way! I got way too much to do! Yeah. You see, being overly busy in the end can be. It can be a way of pursuing godlike status. Like when we think that our schedule, our way to significance, like what we're trying to supply in those moments, what only God can. And I said, I'm, I'm guilty of this. Early on in the church, I just thought, man, I'm going to do everything. I'm going to do everything because I can, because I have the energy. And it's not bad because this is all good stuff for the kingdom. And so I was here on Sundays. I was leading a group on Monday nights. I was leading a group on Tuesday nights. I was leading a group Wednesday nights. I was doing unofficial stuff on Thursdays. I remember... My good friend Steve, he was like, Joe, no, like, no, I don't know, like, are you trying to correct this perception that pastors only work like one hour a week or, or what, dude? Like, that's, that's, you can't be doing that. And in my mind, I'm like, I can't be wrong. And I think in those situations, the question we got to ask is, has, has work become your God? Like, like, when you say, I cannot take a break, I just can't, what you demonstrate to the world, whether intentionally or unintentionally, okay, I, I don't trust God, or, or that my job is more important than anything else. But that being clear, that being said, what is clear, especially from Colossians 2, is that while the formal observance for the Saturday Sabbath, okay, well, that isn't commanded for New Testament believers, it is good to rest because God rested. And we want to mirror what, what God does in word and deed, and God's good. So it's good for us to rest. It's good for us to, to cease from work, from activity. But the truth is, truth is that looks different. And I want to I mention this because I'm the type of person, um, and I think I've been this way as long as I can remember. I blame it for partially for my attention span, but I, I don't do good. Like if you're like, Joe, you have to take Monday and Tuesday off. Don't answer your phone. If anyone needs you from the church, don't do it. That would be like torture for me. I would absolutely hate that. And someone might, I remember early on there was a guy and he told, he told me that. At the church. He's like, you just need to have two days a week, Monday, maybe Monday, Tuesday, because pastor works. You just can't, just don't. I'm like, dude, like, if, if you want to stick that to me, like, that's not going to be restful. Like, I'm going to hate my life for those two days. Like, I, like, I, I, like, I just, I can't do that. He's like, all right, so then we need to figure out something out. I was like, okay. And, and I've been this way, as I said, since, since like college. When I do homework, I'd be the guy that I'd work on a paper and I'd work for, I don't know, a good five, 10, 15 minutes. 
and I take a break for a few minutes. And I work for a few minutes, I take a break. Some people were like, you know, I just studied all night. I worked for like eight hours straight. I'm like, I don't know how you can do that. Like I couldn't pay attention for eight hours straight. So I just worked in spurts. And so what I do is I, I take rest in spurts. Some of you are like, you know, every time I come over to talk to Joe, he's usually like just laying down on his couch. Man, that guy's super, <laughs> that guy's super lazy. It's like he's always laying on his couch. No, no, what I'm doing is I'm, I am mentally and physically resting as I get ready to go into this counseling session. That's what I'm doing, okay? So, so I, what I do is I build like little periodic rest through every day of the week. That's just how I like it. That's how I like it. You know what I love doing? I love going to play hockey Wednesday nights. That is, oh, man, that's good. That is good stuff. You say, that doesn't count. That can't count. What do you mean it can't count? Some of you, the most restful thing is to go in your garden and just work in your garden. Some of you, the most restful thing is to have a bunch of people over to your house. And some of you, some of you other guys want to just throw stones and be like, nope, can't count that. Nope. Dude, chill out. <laughs> like, it's, see, that's the thing. It's not about legalism. It's not about legalism. It's about rest. It's about enjoyment. And it's very much a conscience issue. You have permission to take time off. You have permission to take a nap. And sometimes we feel bad if we, like, let our hair down. You don't have to feel bad if you let your hair down. Like, like just, as, just as Eve was created so that man wouldn't have to live alone, as we'll see, the Sabbath was created so that man wouldn't have to live exhausted. Okay? And so whether you take this day off or you build in like I do, I just build in, like, little, like, rest moments every single day. That's okay. And see, this, the Sabbath, like all the rest of the law, it finds its ultimate fulfillment in Christ. It's meant to point us to Christ as our great rest, as our great salvation. I mean, Jesus says, Matthew 11, Come to me, all you who are labor. I'll give you rest. The world's looking for rest. I'll tell you what, no amount of Netflix and chill is going to solve their problem at the end of the day. It's just not. A Sabbath rest then, or the principle from it, becomes a regular reminder that we're not God. It becomes a regular reminder. In those moments where you're like, I, I'm going to lay down, I'm going to take a nap for 45 minutes. It's okay, because guess what? The world is going to keep going for the 45 minutes that you're asleep. No, 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 I can't, I can't, I just can't, I, I, I have too much to do. No, no, the world's going to be okay, okay? For 45 minutes while you take a nap, let your hair down. And in doing so, it's a reflection of your trust in God, who never sleeps or slumbers. He's got it. The world will be okay. He'll be okay without, without you being awake, right? I heard Piper one time, he said, it's, it's such a peculiar thing to think that God ordained for us to spend one-third of our lives asleep, one third of our lives asleep. That's kind of crazy, right? Someone asked me one time, like, why, why do you think that was? What do you think it is? Humility. That for one third of our lives, for eight hours a night or whatever it is, the world will keep, keep going without you. Without you. It is a regular reminder, those moments of rest that we are not God. Well, we keep driving on. Verse 4, these are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. It's really interesting here because there's this very common phrase, these are the descendants of or these are the generations of, and typically you would see these are the generations of David or these are the generations of Abraham or Isaac. Here it says these are the generations of the heaven and the earth. Kind of, kind of weird to see the wording that way, but the point is very clear. That the subsequent story of human history is viewed as the outcome of the creation narrative. What's about to follow all comes from this point. That's why it says it the way it does. Verse 5, when no bush of the field was yet in the land and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land. And there was no man to work the ground. And a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man of the dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. 
So here is this picture of life that Moses is depicting before the creation of the first man to come and to work the ground. And it says in verse 8, And the Lord God, he planted a garden in Eden. Common Common misconception, right? Eden's the name of the garden. Actually, Eden is the name of the region. The garden is in this region called Eden, right there, verse 8. In the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So here's this place. And uh, got the garden. We got Adam. Got two trees. One, One tree, tree of life. Adam, as long as he keeps eating from that tree, he stays alive. And then we have this other tree. Tree of knowledge of good and evil. And uh, every day, right? Every day Adam's going to be seeing this tree. They're right there. Every day he's got to walk past that tree. And it's this, this picture, really. If you think about it, they're both right there in the middle of the garden. It's this picture of faith. It's this picture of trust. Every day, Adam, what are you going to do? Are you going to love God? Or are you going to obey God? It's really this, this, this picture in many ways. God is like this parent. He tells his children, Adam, here you are. You got all this stuff. Tree of life. Tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Don't eat that tree. And when we hear that, we're like, I bet you I can eat that tree. I know he said not to do it, but are they God? I bet you, you know what? It's not really going to harm me, right? And there's this picture, right? God's like this parent. Don't drink the Clorox bleach. And we're like, hmm, I bet you, I bet you a little sip wouldn't hurt me. Or don't, don't stick your finger in the, in the wall socket, right? And you're like, is it really going to harm me? I did that when I was a little boy. So don't do it. And I was like, Okay, well, if they, she says it's not going to harm you, but is it really going to... Yeah, that, that was not a good feel. Only one time, right? One time's all it takes. You're like, yep, not doing that again. But that's, that's how we think, right? We think, I can do whatever I want and not get burned. We're like, you're not the boss of me. I'm an adult. I went to college. I'm a second semester freshman. <laughs> you know those people, right? And God, God, God's like, God's a good God, right? I mean, think, think about God. He's not trying to be a buzzkill. He's a good God. I mean, he made the earth. He made the animals. He made the garden. Heck, he's about to give Adam a naked woman. Like, he's a pretty good God. He is. And every day, Adam, he's got to, like, make a choice. Like, every day, he's got to make a choice. Am I going to choose to obey God? Or am I going to do my own thing and sin? Like every day, every day, he's seeing these two trees, right? And here, here's the realization, right? Whatever that temptation is, one thing I think we see, because whatever that temptation is for you, because we all, we all have those, those things, pride is so often the root of so many of these problems. And we think, I can cross the line, right? I, eh, is it really going to hurt me? I can, I can, I can just bend, the, I can bend the, the limits a little bit. I know, I know I'm not supposed to. I know God said not to. But is it really? I mean, if you read this story, you know that's the thought process that's going to go through their minds. And, uh, and that certainly is a thought process that goes through ours in those moments. Well, verse 10. Uh, a river flowed out of Eden to water the garden. So there's a river coming through the garden and there it divided and it became four rivers. So it's one river that goes through, it splits off, it goes four. The name of the first is the Pishon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Havila where there is gold. I remember when I met Havila. It was like, oh, that's a, that's a very ethnic name that you have. Um, I actually found out before the service, she didn't actually have a name for like the first couple days. True story, right? But, but this, is, this is why she's called Havila, in case you're wondering. But here's Havilah. Here's the land. There's gold there. 
And the gold of that land, it's good. Bedellium and onyx, stone are there. And, and the name of the second river is the, the Gihon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Cush. And the name of the third river is the, the Tigris, which flows east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. Some people always ask, do we know where the garden is? Do we have any idea? Can we find the garden? Let's go find the garden. Well, part of the problem is we, we only know where two of these rivers are. Two of them, we don't know where they are. It's possible, possible that after the flood, that the rivers were relocated. But we don't know. Well, he continues in verse 15. He says, the Lord God took the man, put him in the garden of Eden, to, there's that word again, work it. Work is good. God made work. Not always fun, but work is good. We're made to work. To work it, to keep it. Verse 16, And the Lord God, he commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So he's commanded Don't do it. The the word commanded occurs 25 times in Genesis. First occurrence where the narrative introduces this divine command. And as I've already said, guys, the instruction that the Lord gives, whether you like it or not, it's, it's positive instruction. It's good instruction. It's not bad instruction. God is not trying to implement some type of harsh restrictions. He's a good God. We've seen that. Well... One thing people ask has to do with Adam. Some people will theorize that, well, if he hadn't sinned, maybe, you know, he'd still be alive. Um, so people you know, they speculate. Do you think that's possible, you know? And I think, what's, what I think the reality is what kept Adam alive is not because he was created immortal. What kept him alive is because God's a good, loving God, and he made this tree for him to eat of. So, in other words, Adam doesn't forfeit his immortality by his sin. Because immortality, according to 1 Timothy chapter 6.16, well, that is the trait of God alone. But rather, as, as John Calvin, the great Bible teacher, noted, and here's what he said about this idea, that Adam's earthly life, it, it would have been temporal. Even if he didn't sin, it would have been temporal. Yet he would have passed into heaven without death, without injury. That'd be nice. That'd be nice. Well, we come to verse 18. We're going to spend a lot of time in 18 today, but it says this. Then the Lord God said, It's not good for man that he should be alone. I'm going to make him a helper fit for him. Can I get an amen? Because some of you like that verse. You'll like it more in a second. Now, out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. And the man gave names to all the livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs, closed up its place with flesh, And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman. He brought her to the man. So, here it is. It's not good for man to be alone. Not good. And uh, some of you, maybe you've been given the spiritual gift of singleness. It's possible. There's nothing wrong with that. But uh, God realizes this guy Adam... Adam needs a helper. He needs a helper. Guys, you need a helper. You do. You can usually tell. I'm just saying. You usually can tell the married guys from the single guys. You're like, yep, he's got a helper. <laughs> like, I, I didn't put this together today. Like, uh, I, I usually never do. I, every, every Sunday, I'm like, hey, what tie am I supposed to wear again? Is it the brown shoes? With, like, you can tell, right? <laughs> Remember when I, uh, before I got married? I'm not making this up. Um, my, in my living room, I had my TV, my chair, my couch. That's all I had. And when I say my TV, it was just sitting there on the floor. <laughs> I was happy. I was good with that. My, my, my silverware, not making this up again. I had two cups, two plates, two spoons, two forks. I'm like, why would I need anything more than that, right? Uh, 
He's like, man, hmm, man needs a helper. Not good for man to be alone. Not good for man to be alone. And uh, it's good for us, guys. It's good to find a helper. In fact, I'd say, when you do find a helper, it's foolish to not consult your helper. A lot of guys, really foolish guys, right? They don't consult their helper. They're like, hey, babe, what's that? Brand new truck. Huh, you didn't tell me about that. No, was, it, was I supposed to? Mm-hmm, yeah, before you just bought a $50,000 truck, I, th- I think that would be good, because we're not independently wealthy at all. Good to consult your helper. God gave you a helper. You should consult your helper, right? She's your battlefield general. But uh, a lot of guys are just like, you know, Joe, I don't want to complicate this. I, I, just, want, I just want a wife that's hot, okay? <laughs> no, I don't think I'm asking too much. I'm like, okay, maybe we can compromise. How about a, a Proverbs 31 woman who's hot? You're like, I'll take that. <laughs> is, she, is she helpful? Is she, is she helpful? You, guys, you want to find a wife that's helpful. And wives, you want to help your husband. You want to help your husband. If he starts to get off doctrinally, you say, oh, that can't happen. How, how many people, how many celebrity, Bible, people, music, whatever, they've gotten off doctrinally? Okay? So don't think, I'm not going to get off doctrinally. Oh, okay, that sounds like pride. It, it does. Wives, help your husband. He starts to get off doctrine and be like, eh, I don't know about that. Like, what does the Bible say? That's, that's a great, what does the Bible say about that? That's a great question, right? Help your husband. Don't just let him crash the ship. I mean, some, sometimes, sometimes wives say, oh, I'm just supposed to be submissive. Okay, there's, there's a time and a place, right? If, if the ship is about to crash, you should probably say something. Like, don't be a doormat. You don't want the chip to crash. If he starts to get off morally, help him. If he starts to get off financially, help him. And this is just Hebrews 3, 12, and 13 stuff. And I'd also say, guys, you, you also can help your wives. If they're struggling in these areas, you can help them too. God says, not good for man to be alone. Man, he needs a helper. Women, you want to find a man that you can help, not fix. Oh. <laughs> I got to get a drink. <laughs> Please do not confuse this. A lot of women are like, well, yes, he, he has a drug addiction and, and a porn addiction, and he lives with his parents, but he's trying, like, really hard, Joe. Help, not, not fix, okay? You're, you're supposed to help him, not, not fix him. And, and there are, are a lot of girls who I think are well-intentioned and they make excuses for a lot of little boys. You're, you're his helper. You're not there to fix him. I don't care how much potential he has. And so, so what does God do? Adam, it's not good that you're alone. I'm going to make you a helper. Now, we don't know what Eve looked like. The Bible doesn't say. Um... But compared to the other options out there, <laughs> there's a goat. I mean, the, I, no, pass. Right? Uh, there's a horse. Yeah, I'm going to pass. Okay. I mean, compared to the other options, okay, I imagine she was looking pretty good. But, but we live in a world where, we live in a world, here's the reality, we live in a world where sometimes there's just too many options. Like, too many guys are like, they're the guys, and they have the wife of the imagination and these really unrealistic standards. What are you looking for? Ah, you know, I'm looking for like the swimsuit model slash homeschool mom who speaks Latin. Oh, anything else? Because, like, she, she doesn't exist. And, and if she does exist, like, she's not going to be into you because she probably has way too many other options. She's <laughs> just, just like... That's what it's like, right? So, so many guys today, so many young dudes, we're like, this wife of the imagination. What, what should she look for? She look for a helper. Does she love Jesus? Is she a helper? I want that. And, and also, you guys, you've got to understand that, that not all women, not all women are great. Proverbs talks about this. Some women, they're like, they're like crowns, and some women are like cancers. You don't want cancer. Okay, you don't want that. Like, the goal isn't just to get a wife. The goal is to get a helpful wife. You say, Joe, I found a girl. Is she helpful? No, but she's hot. 
She's on. Okay, guys. So is hell. <laughs> you want a helpful wife, guys. Doesn't matter how pretty she is. She's not helpful? Whew. Okay, that's, that's going to be a nightmare. And, and as I said, so many guys... They're, they're chasing after this, this, woman, this woman of fantasy that they overlook legit girls who love Jesus who are right in front of them or are next to them or sitting behind them or in front of them, like whatever. No, but it's true. Like there's so many guys who just, just miss it. And there's so many like legit girls who love Jesus and they get overlooked. Well, notice what he says in verse 23. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. The very first words recorded in human history. Okay? Very first words recorded by man in human history. He calls her woman. Guys, it's important that you call your wife, your girlfriend, fiance, it's important that you call her good things. You want to encourage her. You want to say good things and kind things. You want to build her up. You say, it doesn't matter what I call her. Okay, well, just try calling her by your ex-girlfriend's name and see how that works out for you. Okay? Promise, it, it ain't going to go well, guys. No, he calls her woman. He says good things. We should say good things to our wives. We should build them up. We should encourage them. And then what does he say? Look what he says, verse 24. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become... One flesh, okay? Like hashtag, like doing married stuff. That's, that's what he's talking about. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Marriage. Here's a picture of the first marriage. And if there was a hashtag that I could drop right here, it would be responsibility. Notice, he leaves his father and his mother. Leaves his father and mother. Well, that means I have to get a job. Mm-hmm, yeah. I guess they're paying bills. I know. Okay, you want to be responsible, guys. I want you to be responsible. God wants you to be responsible. He wants you to be more mature. I know some of you might be here. You're 18. You're a young guy. Okay, it might sound scary. Okay, listen, baby steps. We're going to work toward that goal. But we eventually want to get to that goal. We're, we're responsible men. We want to be responsible men. Marriage, marriage is for men. And marriage is about responsibility. Marriage is for men. It's not for boys. See, a lot of guys think that if I get married, m- marriage is going to make me a man. Marriage doesn't make you a man. Like, so much of this is centered on responsibility. So much of this is resp- uh, centered on responsibility. And I will say, you know, there are great motivating factors. Uh, women, they definitely, they definitely have a way to, to motivate men. There's no doubt. I mean, how many times do you guys see? You see this guy. He's, a, he's you know, putzing around. Kind of a loser. And then all of a sudden, he's like, whoa, he's got a job? He's got clothes? I think I even... Did he put deodorant on today? I smell cologne. What, he's, what happened? He met a girl? Okay. Like, like, women have a way to motivate guys. And they move heaven and earth. Like, it's good. It's good. Uh, girls, find a guy you can help but that you don't have to fix. I, a lot of girls... Whew. When it comes to this, right, they, uh, they, they usually go one of two ways, right, um, on the standard. They go so far this way or so far this way. Like, for example, this is, right, some girls, like, their standards are so unrealistic that there's, like, legit dudes who love Jesus, good dudes, guys that are taking responsibility, growing in holiness, loving Jesus, and she's like, well, I mean, I'm really looking for like minus like 4 to 5% body fat, so that doesn't work, right? <laughs> so like, no, like some girls, like their standards are so high, I mean, Jesus could come by and be like, hey, would you like to hang out? And she's like, I'm not really into facial hair. <laughs> and, and then there's the other extreme, right? And, and the other extreme is like the standard is like so low. It's like, like oh, man, uh, as long as he's breathing... I'll go out with him, right? I mean, it doesn't even matter. And it's like, you smell that. It's like, that is desperate. Like, I don't know. That's, that's what that is. It's just 
that's, that's what it is. It's just reeks of desperation. But for some girls, it's just like, oh, I just want a guy so bad. If I just get a guy, like the stars will align. My life will be better. It'll be better. I, like, I just know it will. Man, I can tell you some stories. I still remember this young girl. Uh, I was a friend of mine, and I was like, don't marry that guy. Don't marry him. He's not a Christian. Well, he says he's a Christian. Yeah, he's not. Like, look at his life. Okay? I don't care if he says he's a Christian, right? Titus 1.16, they profess to know God. They deny God by their actions. Well, you know, I think that... She's just trying to fix him. Six months later, after they get married, divorced. Some girls, you think, you think getting into that relationship will just make everything better. And then you get into the relationship and you're like, this is a prison. I hate my life. Some of you guys have friends like that. You, you know people and they're like, uh, I didn't realize how much happier I was when I was single. Because this is awful. Like, really, really awful. Oh, girls. Uh, the, the, I think there's somewhere in between, right, for those things. You, you want to find a guy you can help? You want to find a guy who loves Jesus, who's walking with Jesus, who's obeying Jesus? That, that's important. It's really, really important. But, um... We look at this text, verse 24. Man, leaving father and mother, holding fast to his wife, then they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. So what's the order? What's the sequence? You see the sequence? A man grows up, right? He grows up, he gets married, and then he gets to do married stuff. See, see what happens today in our society is there's a lot of boys who don't want to grow up, but they want to do all the married stuff. And... Uh, that's not what God says. That's not, that's, that's not what God says. What does he say? They were not ashamed. They, they were not ashamed. And I'll tell you right now, uh, it's very common. You know what's really common? Christian couples, they get married. They get married and uh, first year marriage is awful. Especially when it comes to intimacy. Because during their life, before they were married, they were doing married stuff with other people and they felt shame and such conviction, right? And now they're married and they associate all the stuff they're doing now in the marriage context with all the junk from their past. Even though what they're doing now, right, it's in the context of marriage, but from that, all the past, like that gets brought up. Like that's a thing, okay? Man, I've counseled, I've counseled people about this. It really thing, I, really a big thing, guys. People think, just like we were talking about earlier, oh, I'm not going to get burned. Don't, don't eat of that tree, right? Uh, I, I can do it. I can do it and not get burned. I can, I can you know, or I'll, I'll only eat a little bit of it, or it's not really going to be, I mean, can we really count that? I mean, that's not technically a sin, right? You think you got away with it. No, it's, it's, it's a thing. It's a, it's a thing that I think is more and more frequent within the church today. And how, how, How's life going? Man, it, it, it sucks, right? I don't even want to be intimate with my wife, or I don't even want to be intimate with my husband, because every time I am, I just feel so dirty and so much shame uh, from all the things from my past that I associate with what I'm doing right now. Like, God's a good God. There's a reason, like, He gives the instruction that He gives. Like, we should listen to Him, but we don't. I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to do it my way. You know, He's not the boss of me. I, I know a lot of these topics today, they, they have the potential to, to bring up a lot of stuff. A lot of stuff from your past. A lot of stuff maybe that you just, ooh, I don't want to think about that, right? So here's what I want to say. Number one, if there is sin, right, in your life, you're doing things you're not supposed to be doing, you need to stop doing those things. You need to stop. Don't make excuses, okay? Don't make excuses. Some people are like, Oh, but I really love him. Okay? No, no you don't. Or we're, we're, we're married, like, in our hearts. No, no you're not. Nope, doesn't, nope. Like, if, if you're sinning today, I don't care what the sin is. You need to stop. You need to ask God's forgiveness. Not make excuses, ask his forgiveness. Number two, and if there is shame that some of you guys are dealing with, I want to just remind you, Jesus died for that shame. Right there, that's Romans 8.1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. 
We think about Jesus dying on the cross, we think, oh yeah, I get to be with him in heaven, or I get to escape the wrath of God, okay? All good things. There's a lot of reasons why Jesus Christ came to die. In fact, Piper wrote a book called 50 Reasons Why Christ Came to Die. One of the reasons he came to die is to destroy shame. Destroy shame. If there's shame that, that you deal with and struggle, I just want to preach truth to you. What's truth? It's the gospel. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You're forgiven. You're a new creation. Number three, for those of you who struggle with obedience, which is, I don't know, like all of us, <laughs> right? Think about the story that we just talked about today, Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2 gives us this awesome picture of a good God. I'm so glad we have a good God. I'm so glad we don't have a bad God. That would really stink. But we have a good God who gives good instruction. He's not giving us instruction to keep us from fun or to run on our parade. He's given good, giving us good instruction to protect us. And I want to encourage you with that. Oh, he gives us good instruction, brothers and sisters. May we have the wisdom to listen to it. And so as the team comes today, I just want to pray for us. Jesus, we love you. And we thank you that you are a good, good God. I mean, we don't deserve you. We're not worthy. And yet, like, you love us. I mean, think about your kindness to Adam. Lord, I pray that you would grant us a heart of obedience. I pray, Lord, that you would convict us, Lord, today. If there's, there's stuff in our life that we need to be convicted of, I pray we wouldn't make excuses. I pray we wouldn't fight you. I pray, Lord, that we'd submit our life to you. In those areas that maybe we struggle obeying you. We struggle kind of mm, doing our own thing. Help us, Jesus. Help us, Jesus. Because at the end of the day, Lord, like my goal for myself and all of us is that we love you, not just, not just with our words, but also with our deeds, Lord. And we need your help, God. This is hard, Lord. It's really hard. And so, Lord, we join with the, the church father, Augustine, as he would say and pray so often, Lord, command what you will and give what you command. Lord, command what you will. We've seen what you've commanded. We just read this. Command what you will. Okay. And give what you command. Lord, enable us to do the things that are so hard sometimes to do. Help us, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.